All right, today we're going to talk about God's plan for man. And we're going to go from creation to holy to death and eternity. Okay? It's, you know, it's not really death, actually. It's, it's eternity, just passing from corruptible to incorruptible. But uh, we're going to start out today in Jeremiah chapter 1. We're going to see a little bit of insight here into what happens before a baby's even born, before they're even formed, actually. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 4 and 5 is what we're going to read. Okay, it says here, Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Now, people that defend abortion, they say, well, that's this verse here is only for Jeremiah. And they'll say, because it says there about, I've, you know, I sanctified thee and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Now, that part's true. That's only for Jeremiah. But you see a teaching here in Scripture, a something that, you know, a truth that's tall here is what I'm looking to say. Before I formed thee in the belly. It doesn't say before you were formed. It says before I formed thee. Okay? A lot of people today, you say, where does a baby come from? And they'll explain the scientific process. It's not a scientific process. It's a spiritual, supernatural process. God forms a baby in the womb. The baby just doesn't come about and God's up there and he goes, a baby was born? Oh, I didn't know about that. You know, God knows. God forms the baby. Okay, we're going to see the importance of that here as we continue in this study. What are the purpose of babies? Turn back to Psalm 127. Psalm 127, verse 3. Okay, it says here, Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is His reward. Wow. doesn't say the reward of good parents that come together and, and you know are good people and they deserve to have a child. Uh-uh. It says that it's His reward. Isn't that something? You know what your children are if you have children? They're God's. Would that be an interesting thing to say? Somebody says, oh, are these your children? No, they belong to God. <laughs> They've just been entrusted to me to take care of them. Amen. Yeah. And it's interesting because people say, you know, this lost world, I'm sure atheists or whatever, they'd be like, oh, you know, these aren't God's children. These are my children. Well, if they die before they get to be accountable, they'll be going back to God. Amen. They're God's children. Yes, they are. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, and you better think about that too, these people that commit abortion and, and Christians that teach that abortion is okay and that it's not murder. It says there it's His reward. A little child, a little baby is God's reward. You know, I don't think He likes to have His rewards killed. Bad thing. Now, can a woman have a baby against God's will? If God doesn't want a woman to have a child, can she have the child against God's will? Turn back to Genesis chapter 20. Genesis chapter 20, verse 17. going to see an interesting thing here. Now, if you read Genesis chapter 20, basically, uh, Abraham goes to this Abimelech into his area there, and he tells um, Sarah, his wife, he says, you know, act like you're my sister, you know, because I'm afraid this guy's going to kill me. You know, he chickens out. And um, basically, God, you know, the, Abimelech takes Sarah to be his wife, and God, you know, curses him until he gives him back. But look at verse 17 here. you see something interesting. So Abraham prayed unto God, and God healed Abimelech and his wife and his maidservants, and they bare children. For the Lord had fast closed up all the wombs of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. Hmm. Isn't that interesting? God closed up the wombs. Didn't matter. They said, I want to have kids. Doesn't matter. God closed up the womb. And there are some times when you have people that are so wicked, God says, Nope, no kids for you. 
I don't want you to have those children. Sometimes he does. Okay, I can't understand that. Sometimes, you know, I've, I've known of Christians and things that are good people and they can't have children. I don't understand that. I don't understand what the purpose is there. God does, you know, but I don't know. But the point is, it's not a scientific process. God can say, no children, or yes, I'll give you a child. And then He forms that child inside the womb. No matter how wicked a woman is or a family is, husband and wife, whatever the situation, it's still God forming that child in that womb. It's really something. Now go to Genesis chapter 29. Genesis 29 verse 31. I'm going to see some more interesting things here. Genesis chapter 29 verse 31. And when the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. And Leah conceived and bare a son, and she called his name Reuben. For she said, Surely the Lord hath looked upon my affliction. Now therefore my husband will love me. And she conceived again and bare a son, and said, Because the Lord hath heard that I was hated, he hath therefore given me this son also. And she called his name Simeon. And she conceived again and bare a son, and said, Now this time will my husband be joined unto me, because I have borne him three sons. Therefore was his name called Levi. And she conceived again, and bare a son, and she said, Now will I praise the Lord, therefore she called his name Judah, and left bearing. Now look at verse uh, or chapter 30, verse 1. And when Rachel saw that she bare Jacob no children, Rachel en envied her sister, and said unto Jacob, Give me chil uh, excuse me, children, or else I die. And Jacob's anger was kindled against Rachel, and he said, Am I in God's stead? Who hath withheld from thee the fruit of the womb? See, she came to her husband and she said, It's your fault. Give me children. Come on. And he said, Am I God? Am I in God's stead? Can I do anything about it? No. There wasn't anything he could do about it. They could try all they want to have a child. And if God says no, the answer is no. Okay? And of course, you know, later on she ends up having a child. You know? But... The point is there at that point in time, huh? And you know, again, there were some reasons there. You know, she, you know, Jacob loved Rachel more than he loved her older sister. You know, there and and you know for whatever reasons there the Lord had. But uh, we're going to go next to Revelation chapter four. Revelation chapter four. We're going to see. We already saw there about the, the fruit of the womb is, is God's reward, His reward, it says there in the text. But we're going to see why God creates little babies, why He creates people. We're going to see about that. Revelation chapter 4, verse 11. It's kind of interesting because this is a future event that when we are called up to be with the Lord, we're actually going to be there for this. Strange, isn't it? You know, you think about the Bible being in the past, like this was written way back there in the first century, almost 2,000 years ago, and yet it hasn't happened yet. Mm -hmm. And when it does happen, we are going to be there at the throne hearing it happen. The Bible's an amazing book. Amen. Revelation chapter 4, verse 11. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things. All things. And for thy pleasure they are and were created. God creates babies for his pleasure. Okay, they are his reward. That's what it's about. That's why the Bible says God's not willing that any should perish. Okay, we're going to see about that as we continue here. Ephesians chapter 3. Go to Ephesians chapter 3 verse 9 is where we're going to go next. Okay, Ephesians 3, nine, And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. That's been changed in a lot of the new versions. They change it there. They just say, who created all things, period. They don't say, by Jesus Christ. You know why? Because they don't believe Jesus Christ is God. But right there, it says He is. 
Jesus Christ is God, and He created all things. And I'm going to show you something else that's interesting here. Turn back a little bit to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, verse 12. I have to go back a couple verses here from where we actually want to read just to get into context who we're talking about. Colossians chapter 1, verse 12. Giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Again, another verse attacked in the modern versions. They take out through his blood. Okay, but notice it says there, the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood. Okay, this passage is talking about Jesus. Go to verse 15. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? Jesus Christ. For by him were all things created. Remember we just read there in Ephesians? See? That are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. Scripture with Scripture. This is how you rightly divide the word of truth. Compare Scripture with Scripture. Okay? That's so important. A lot of people don't get that today. They'll take a verse out and, it, and then they twist it and make it say something that doesn't line up with other Scriptures. Okay? No, you compare Scripture with Scripture. Now look at verse 17. This is very interesting here. And He is before all things, and by Him all things consist. I love that verse. <laughs> you know, I don't need Jesus. Don't tell me about this Jesus. You realize if God gave those people what they wanted, they said, don't talk to me about Jesus. I don't need him. If if the Lord just said, okay, you don't need Jesus. See ya. By him all things consist. They drop over dead. Isn't that something? You know, it's like a, an electronic appliance saying, I don't need that electricity in the wall I'm plugged into. Mm -hmm. Okay, pull the plug. You know? By him all things consist. Verse 18. And he is the head of the body, the church, not the government through 501c3. Amen. I had to throw that in there. <laughs> Who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell, and having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. Notice there again, it says reconcile all things. Okay? God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. All right? We'll be hitting that in just a little bit here again. Okay? Uh, now, we see there about the thing of a baby being created. What's the purpose of a baby? Why does God allow babies to be formed? You know, we see that. Now, when the baby is born and they become a child, what about that? What about childhood? Luke chapter 18. We've gone from creation, and birth, now God's plan for man when they become a child. Luke chapter 18, verse 15. Okay. Luke 8, 18, 15 says, And they brought unto him also infants, that he would touch them. But when his disciples saw it, they rebuked them. But Jesus called them unto him and said, Suffer little children to come unto me, and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. Verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child shall in no wise enter therein. That's very interesting. Okay? Why did Jesus Christ say that these child, these children, that their minds were, you know, associated with the kingdom of God? Well, because children possess three things. First of all, they have innocence. Okay? A child can understand that mommy or daddy's upset with them, but they don't really know why sometimes as far as that they're sinning before God. Okay? I should clarify that. <laughs> you know, sometimes they know they're doing wrong, but they don't understand, hey, I'm sinning against heaven here. You know, we had this sermon a couple weeks ago there about the prodigal son. And what did he say? He said, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight. 
See, that's when you get older. We'll be talking about that in a minute. Okay. Secondly, a child has trust. Children are very trusting. Okay. I mean, it's you can actually deceive them very easily that way. You can say, "There's a pink elephant outside," and they go, "Really? You know, <laughs> I mean, something that doesn't even exist." But they'll trust you. Okay. That's how we should be with the Lord. Thirdly, they have purity. A child has a pure mind. You know, there's the old saying, you'll understand when you're older. And unfortunately, that's true. That's a very unfortunate thing. There's a lot of things that when you're little, when you're a little child, you just don't understand. Why do people do that? That's kind of weird, you know. And you get older, I don't know, I understand. And your mind's defiled, <laughs> you know. But wouldn't it be nice to have those three characteristics as a Christian? Innocence, trust, and purity? Hmm. For of such is the kingdom of God. Something to think about. Now, we're going to see something interesting here. Go to Romans chapter 7. Now, if you're a Calvinist and you're listening to this message, you're probably going to want to skip forward here. You're not going to like this part. You're not going to want to hear this because your, your faith in your hero, John Calvin, is going to be shaken. Romans chapter 7, verse 7. Okay, it says here, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Excuse me, God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin but by the law. For I had not known lust except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. Now look at this one. Look at verse 9 here. For I was alive without the law once. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. What in the world is that talking about? Think about it. He was alive without the law. When are you without the law? As a little child, before you understand that you can sin against God. So he was alive without the law. If he would have died, he would have gone to heaven. And we're going to see about that in just a minute here. We're going to, I'm going to show you the verses on that. He was alive without the law. Okay? But when the commandment came, notice it doesn't say, but when sin came. It says, but when the commandment came, when he understood the commandments, when he understood the law that we just read about there, I had not known sin but by the law. When the commandment came, sin revived. That seed of sin that was in him that came from Adam, if you go back far enough, sin revived. Now it became sin in God's sight. And I died. He died spiritually at that point in time. I understand now that God's commandments say, Thou shalt not bear false witness. You know, that's probably the first one that you break. You know, honor thy father and mother. That's probably pretty close to the second one <laughs> as a child. You know, thou shalt not covet. Yeah, thou shalt not covet. That, you know, I mean, on and on. You know, when the sin or when the commandment comes, then you go, oh no, I realize now, I heard about that, I know that this is wrong, but I did it anyhow. Well, now see, that's a problem. Now you're a child of disobedience. Okay? Continuing on here, verse 10. And the commandment, which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. See, well, I'll continue here. I want to comment, but... Verse 11, For sin taking occasion by the commandment deceived me, and by it slew me. Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just and good. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid, but sin that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin might, by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. You see, the law is actually a good thing unless you try to be saved by it. Then the law becomes a very horrible thing because you realize you're doing everything that you can to keep the law and keep it and keep it and you just can't. And, and it creates this artificial, self-righteous type of a thing. And a lot of these Catholic priests are that way. On, at their, I don't know if you want to call it a church, but at their temple or whatever on Sunday mornings, oh, they're just the picture of holiness. But what were they doing last night? See, 
outwardly you say, oh, I keep the commandments. I'm a holy priest or something like that. But inwardly, you're rotten to the core. That's what happens when you try to keep the law. When you try to keep it for salvation, it's actually a curse to you. You know, Martin Luther, way back when, you know, he was he was saying about, you know, how can I love a God that's that's so judgmental and mean and everything like that? Why? Well, he was trying to be justified by the law. Okay? It's not about being justified by the law. That's not the purpose of the Ten Commandments. The purpose of the Ten Commandments is, here's God's easy test to show you that you're a sinner. Once you accept, yes, I am a sinner, now you're ready for salvation. It's a very simple thing. The law is good. It's just designed to show you that you're a sinner. Okay? The, the, I think the, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we yeah. be justified by faith. Is that Galatians? Mm -hmm. Galatians, yep. Yeah. So, uh, I want to show you something else that's interesting here. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 22. Revelation 22, verse 18. I had a real hard time with this verse, understanding what this meant. But then I I actually heard a really good exposition there of Romans chapter seven by a brother over in the UK, John Davis. You know, and and he really got into this thing, and it was like, yeah, okay, you know, that makes sense. It's really good. But uh, read here in Revelation chapter twenty-two, verse eighteen and nineteen. It says here, for I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. Now, for a while, I kind of looked at that and I thought, <clears throat> is this an attack on eternal security? I mean, maybe this is saying that a guy is safe because it, the name's obviously in the book of life. And it's taken out of the book of life. You know, if you call me on the phone, I've always said this. You call me on the phone and you say, hey, what were you doing? I just took some biscuits out of the oven. You know, you can't say, well, the biscuits were never in the oven. They were in and now they're out. Okay, so what's the deal here? Why is the guys, you know, you take words out of the book of life and you're, or you're I'm sorry, the, the words of the book of this prophecy, God takes your name out of the, or part out of the book of life. What's going on there? Well, I think in the very beginning, before the law comes and everything, you have, uh, you're innocent basically before God. But when you get older and you reject Jesus Christ and you start messing around with the book, you know, I think God says, okay, your name's out of the book of life. You're lost. Okay? Now, here's a problem for the Calvinists. You see, I believe that everybody at first is written into the book of life. And it's up to them to take themselves out. Okay? And when you get to that point where you reject Jesus Christ in your life of your own free will, you're out. Okay? I do not believe in elect and non-elect babies, in other words. That is a heresy. <clears throat> Proverbs 13.13 13 says, Whoso despiseth the word shall be destroyed, but he that feareth the commandment shall be rewarded. Don't despise the Word of God. And I've even seen Christians, and I do believe some of these guys that are out there that defend the new versions and attack the King James, some of them, I believe, are saved. They're just ignorant. They're parroting the lies that they've been taught at their seminary or whatever else. But it's interesting because I've seen this over and over again. When they start to despise the Word of God and make fun of the King James Bible, God will knock them down hard. You know, It's a very dangerous thing to mess with this book. Very dangerous. <clears throat> now, Romans chapter 4, verse 15. We're going to go there next. It's kind of interesting too because the thing about you know adding to or taking away from Scripture, you think that only Bible scholars do that? Well, not really. Actually, all lost men and women do that. You know, I, I've never met anybody who's out there in the world that doesn't you know, at least respect some part of the Bible. You know, there's a lot of things in our English language that come that are based on the King James Bible. And they'll use those, and oh, that's kind of nice, you know. I mean, the United Nations building has, you know, verses from Isaiah on the front of it, you know, about beating your sword into uh, 
can't yes. pile shares and your spears into pruning hooks. I always get those two confused. But, you know, that's what they'll do. The lost world will accept certain parts of the Scripture, but they reject others. So their name's taken out of the book of life. They take their own name out. Romans chapter 4, verse 15 says here, Because the law worketh wrath, for where no law is, there is no transgression. Okay? When you don't understand the law as a child, there's no transgression. If a child, I remember my niece, uh, one of my nieces, she would take, uh, Laney, she'd, she'd take candy when she was little, and she'd take it, and she'd put it down here, and she'd move it real slow up over her chest, under her chin, and move it around and into her mouth. <laughs> <laughs> the only problem was it'd be like a Hershey kiss and you'd see like the chocolate, you know, <laughs> around the mouth and like, did you eat chocolate? No, no. <laughs> what was she doing? She was lying and she was stealing. But did she know that she was offending God by that? No. If she would have died and, you know, praise the Lord, she didn't. But if she would have died, she wouldn't have gone to hell for that. She didn't know. Okay. Where no law is, there's no transgression. Turn to Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Romans chapter 5, verse 12 and 13. Now, if you remember there in Romans 7, Paul talked about sin revived. Here's what's going on. Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. You know, thank you very much, Adam. You know, we have sin passed down to us. Verse 13. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. So there again you see it. God does not impute sin. Impute in the Bible means putting something on someone else's account. God does not say, little baby there, you just lied. I'm going to put sin on you. I'm going to burn you in hell. Nope. God doesn't do that. Now, we've seen creation birth of a baby and now we've seen childhood now i'm not going to say the next one is adulthood because i'm going to say the knowing sinner <laughs> you know because people come to a knowledge of sin they come to that knowledge of i'm sinning before god they come to a knowledge before or at, excuse me at different times okay sometimes a child will come to that knowledge very young sometimes it'll be later okay i'm not going to set any kind of age for it children mature at different times all right, and I think it's wrong to set an age for that. I know some do here. The charity ministries people say, what, like 10 or 12 or something like that? Mormons set it at 8. 8? Eight. Mormons, okay. Yep, well, we're not going to be doing that. No. Romans chapter 5, verse 6. Jump up there. Okay, it says here, For when we were with yet with... Excuse me. For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more being reconciled we shall be saved by his life." And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Okay? When a boy or a girl reaches that age where they can understand that they've sinned against God's laws, then they qualify for salvation. Just as simple as that. Romans chapter 10. Turn there. Romans chapter 10, verses 1 through 3. Okay, brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. You know, there's a lot of people that are in that same exact position. They go about to establish their own righteousness. In fact, I would say the majority of people go about to establish their own righteousness. As we talked about earlier, they try to keep the commandments. I have a video, an older video about Catholicism, and they were interviewing Catholics as they were coming out of the big cathedral, and they were like, you know, how do you get to heaven? Oh, you know, trying to be good. 
you know, golden rule. You know, I, I, I try to keep the commandments. You know, yeah. Well, how are you doing with that? <clears throat> you know, I remember the one time we were out door to door, and uh, Derek and I were talking to this girl, and I and she said about you know, I think I'm good enough or something, and I said, but how do you know? Have you done enough? If you died right now, do you know for sure that you've done enough good to outweigh the bad? Do you know? And she was like, well, no, I don't, I, I don't know. And I was like, yeah, that's exactly it. You live in a, in a life of torment if you try to be justified by the law. It's a horrible life. And that's not what the purpose of it is. You come to God as a sinner, and then you're ready to be saved. Jesus didn't come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. It's so simple that people miss it because they want to count on themselves. They don't want to think themselves bad. Look at verse 4, Romans chapter 10, verse 4. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to every one that believeth. I didn't see of the elect in there. Maybe it's missing in my Bible. Verse 5. For Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth, doeth those things shall live by them. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise, Say not in thine heart, Who shall ascend into heaven that is to bring Christ down from above? Do you know that that's what every Catholic believes happens at the Eucharist? Transubstantiation. That's what they believe. The priest is pulling Christ down out of heaven every Sunday. You know, and some Catholics, the really strong ones, go every day to Mass. You know, and they partake of Christ every day on a daily basis. How do you explain that verse? Doesn't line up too good with your doctrine there if you're Catholic. Look at verse 7. Or who shall descend into the deep, that is to bring up Christ again from the dead? But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. If you look down at verse 17, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. <clears throat> it's important to have the word of God. Verse 9 that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's that simple. Don't complicate salvation more than it has to be. Okay? People want to make it complicated. It's not complicated. You know, people want to remove repentance from salvation. People want to move preaching against remove preaching against sin from salvation. You can't do that. You know? It's it's just so simple. So I don't want to be told I'm a sinner, but that's the qualifications for you to be saved. It's a simple thing. You know, the law is not evil. And yet that's exactly what a lot of people think. Mm -hmm. Don't tell me I'm a, a liar and a thief and a this and a that. You know, I'm not that bad. Yes, you are. <laughs> now, you go, you're born, you go through childhood, you come to the point where you realize you're a sinner, you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved, now you're a saved Christian. Now what comes next? Okay, this message is not going to be for the lost world. If you're, you know, if you don't make it past the thing of childhood and knowing that you're a sinner, well, that's where it ends for you. You'll end up going to hell with Satan and his angels. That's the way it is. But now you go and you're a saved Christian. Now go to Romans chapter 12. We're going to see what happens after this. And this this is just a very milky message here. This isn't super doctrine or anything. Okay, I just wanted to cover the basics here today of course the basics here is is you know meat for most christian churches yeah. <laughs> you know and i don't say that because i'm something else i just say that because most churches you go to you aren't going to hear more than about five verses of scripture in a sermon yeah not from a king james bible romans chapter 12 verse 1 now these are very easy verses to understand but they sure are hard to put into practice Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. 
He died for you. Are you dying for him? Hmm. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Modern Christianity has violated that verse right there horribly. Be not conformed to this world. They want to be conformed to this world. You know, it's funny because I got this Christian, you know, one of these modern Christian bookstore catalogs, and they had this kid, and his head looks, you know, like a mop or something like that, you know, and he's got like the dirty pants on hanging low, and, and he, uh, and, and it says, he's wearing a t shirt, modeling a t shirt, it says, Be not conformed to this world. <laughs> and I'm like, Yeah, okay, <laughs> you know. I can see a few problems here, you know, and, and they had all these other shirts that were like that you know, satanic looking, you know, jagged edges and like the, these, uh, what do they call them, tribal tattoos and stuff that, that yeah. people get, you know, and the heavy metal look and the electric guitars crossed and all this stuff and skulls and be not conformed to this world, be a good Christian. Yeah, verse 3, For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. Don't get too high and mighty as a Christian. That doesn't mean that you should just, you know, say, I'm no better than the lost world. No, you're better than the lost world because you've accepted the fact that you're a sinner and you are saved. You are a child of the King of Heaven. So, yeah, in that sense, you are better. Okay, but as a Christian, stay humble. Okay, have grace for other believers. That's not always easy to do. But you need to stay humble. You need to remember who you are and from whence you've come. <laughs> okay, remember that stuff. Second uh, Timothy, chapter two. Second Timothy, chapter two, verse eleven. Now, if you present your body as a living sacrifice, the Lord's going to take you down a path of of uh, sanctification. Mm -hmm. It's what the Bible talks about. And I had a brother write to me, a young man the one time, and he's thinking of going into ministry. And I said to him, I likened the Christian faith, the Christian life, as walking down a path. And at first you start out and there's a whole lot of people walking on that path. And you come to a point where there's a crossroad. And you look and you see most people going to the left and the Lord goes to the right. And you go, hmm, well, I want to follow Jesus, so I'm going to go to the right. And you're walking down the path, and you look behind you, and you say, huh, there's a lot less people here now. And you go a little bit farther along, and the Lord says, up, oh, another crossroad, I'm going this way. And you look, and you see people going that way, and you say, I guess I'll go this way with the Lord. And you go to the right path, and you go a little bit farther, and you look back, boy, there's even less people. And to make a long you know, example short here, Eventually, you're going to get to the place, oftentimes, where you're going to realize it's just you and the Lord and a couple other people on that right path. And the frustrating thing is you're going to look back at that left path and you're going to realize, you know, there's some awfully good people that took one of those left paths. Some of my heroes in ministry, the guys that I learned under, I look back now at their ministries and I say, I didn't realize it at the time, but boy, they sure compromised. Boy, they sure compromised to get to where they're at today. Hmm. Oh, they're strong and they're they're bold and they'll tell you off, but they sure compromised in those different areas. You know. Hmm. Second Timothy chapter two verse eleven. It is a faithful saying: For if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful; he cannot deny himself. That's not a verse against eternal security. Okay, I've been over this verse many times. It's a verse that's saying, if you deny Jesus Christ in this life, you don't want to stand for the Bible, you don't want to stand for Jesus, you'll let Him be run down around you, whatever else. You don't want to live according to the Scriptures. If you deny Him in this life, He'll deny you millennial inheritance. Okay, But He's not going to deny Himself. You see, you're part of the body of Christ. There's never going to come a point in time when He's going to say, you know, I mean, you're a member of his body. Wouldn't it be strange for the Lord to be up there and say, I can't stand my thumb, you know, cut it off or something. No, he's not going to do that. He won't deny himself. But what you're going to lose is you're going to lose millennial inheritance. You're going to lose rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. 
And that's going to be a bad thing. Very bad thing. Luke chapter 19. A couple more places to turn to here and then we're done. Luke chapter 19. And I'll tell you what. You know, this thing of sacrifice, maybe I ought to do a message on this sometime. Be real careful about how far you go on that. Okay, there are some people that go too far on the thing of sacrifice. You know, the Bible does teach temperance and moderation. Be careful that you don't sacrifice too much because there are some brethren out there that do that. They sacrifice too much and then they get off in the wrong direction and they make their life about the sacrifice, you know. And it's just kind of like, you got to keep some stuff in balance, okay? Be careful that you don't go too far with anything, all right? I'm not saying that you ought to listen to a little rock music now and then. I'm not saying that. There are some things you get rid of, you eliminate. But I'll tell you what, you know, and I'll just say this from my own personal experience, and I'm not trying to say this to brag or anything, but I've pushed myself a couple times in ministry to almost a snapping point where I'm getting three or four hours of sleep a night and it goes for a week and I'm just research email putting videos together you, you got to take a break yeah. every once in a while the lord jesus went out into the wilderness a couple of times he slept on the boat he didn't say i got ministry to do i got to get out there and i got to preach no he said, let's get in the boat and go out there i got to take a nap <laughs> there are sometimes you have to do that okay if you don't you'll become shipwreck you'll mess yourself up all right so be careful about the thing of sacrifice just want to throw that in there Luke chapter 19, verse 11. Here's an interesting story. And as they heard these things, he added and spake a parable because he was nigh to Jerusalem and because they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. He said, therefore, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, Occupy till I come couple interesting things here before we continue. A certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. <laughs> Who's Jesus speaking about here? Himself. He came to bring the kingdom to the earth. The people rejected him, the Jewish people, the nation of Israel. They rejected him as their king. And so he said, I mean, who's more of a nobleman than Jesus Christ? God of heaven, creator of the universe. He comes down here. He says, I want to set up my kingdom. No, thank you. We don't want it. He says, okay, I'm going to go back, but I'm going to return. I'm going to come again, and I'm going to bring my kingdom then, and it's not going to be up to you. (laughs) But notice it says here, he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds. Now, this is an interesting thing here. Uh, If you compare this, we're not going to go there, but if you compare this to what's going on in Matthew chapter 25, it doesn't say pounds. It says talents. Now, here's the interesting thing about it. Back then, talents were a form of Jewish money. Pounds were a form of Gentile money. Interesting. And notice as, as we continue here, and he says, by the way, occupy till I come. Okay? He doesn't say sell everything that you have and go up on top of a mountain in a white robe and look up at the sky and wait for me. He doesn't say that. He says occupy. Stay busy. Continuing, verse 14 But his citizens hated him and sent a message after him saying, We will not have this man to reign over us. Speaking to the Jews there through a parable. Verse 15. And it came to pass that when he was returned, having received the kingdom, then he commanded these servants to be called unto him to whom he had given the money, that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. Then came the first saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained ten pounds. And he said unto him, Well, thou good servant, because thou hast been faithful in a very little, have thou authority over ten cities. And the second came, saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained five pounds. And he said likewise to him, Be thou also over five cities. And another came, saying, Lord, behold, here is thy pound, which I have laid or kept laid up in a napkin. For I feared thee, because thou art an austere man, thou takest up that that thou layest not down, and reapest that thou didst not sow. And he saith unto him, Out of thine own mouth will I judge thee, thou wicked servant. Thou knewest that I was an austere man, taking up that I laid not down, and reaping that I did not sow. Wherefore then gavest not thou my money into the bank, that at my coming I might have required mine own with usury? 
And he said unto them that stood by, Take from him the pound, and give it to him that hath ten pounds. And they said unto him, Lord, he hath ten pounds. For I say unto you, that, ever, that unto every one which hath shall be given, and from him that hath not even that he hath shall be taken away from him. But those mine enemies, which would not that I should reign over them, bring hither and slay them before me. Now that's a very interesting thing there, and there's a lot. You could just do a sermon just on that one passage. But I just want to make a couple points there. Okay? Um, <clears throat> the, I already said about the thing of occupying till I come, but I just wanted to throw in there 1 Timothy 5 8 and 2 Thessalonians 3 10 to talk about the first in there, 1 Timothy chapter 5 talks about providing for your own. If a man provide not for his own, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. 2 Thessalonians 3.10 talks about if any would not work, neither should he eat. You know, there's a thing there that you're supposed to work for a living right now. Okay, in the coming time of Jacob's trouble, it's going to be a little bit difficult. Okay, working then is going to mean you're going to have to take the mark of the beast probably, be part of the system. It's going to be rough. Okay, the Lord's going to have to supernaturally provide for those people at that time. All right, so there are some dispensational differences there. But this is certainly talking about occupying till I come. Okay, and you got to understand a lot of what's going on in the Gospels is doctrinally being said to the Old Testament Jews. But as Jesus sees, hey, they're rejecting me and I'm going to die on the cross to pay for sins and everything else and the gospel is going to be taken to the Gentiles, he starts to actually say things that are heading that direction. So a hyper-dispensationalist will say, nothing in the Gospels. We do not teach that. Okay, There's a lot in the Gospels. But what did I say earlier? You have to compare Scripture with Scripture. Okay? You have to compare this stuff. And there's some similarities here uh, with the, the servants back in Matthew 25, but then there's a lot of differences as well. Now I want to correct something I said in one of my previous messages I, on gold and silver. I said that banks are never mentioned in the Bible. I was wrong. <laughs> So I was doing this study, I'm like, oh, nuts. <laughs> you know, I hate making mistakes. But it says there in verse 23, Wherefore then gavest not thou my money into the bank, that at my coming I might have required mine own with usury. So, sorry about that. I missed one. Sorry. <laughs> Just thought I better throw that in there. You know, because the thing is, if you don't, then somebody comes along and takes it and uses it against you. So I'll correct it. Um, but it's interesting here, verse 24 it says there that they took the ten pounds from him, but it doesn't say that he was cast into hell, That's like right. the man in Matthew chapter 25. That's right. So you have a different situation here. The man in Matthew chapter 25, the servant that hides his talent, the Lord says, take that unprofitable servant and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and, and gnashing of teeth. Okay? That doesn't happen to this guy. Different situation. What's it about? Well, I think it's about the church age. I think it's about where we're at right now. The Lord says, Occupy. I'm going to give you talents that you're supposed to use for me. If you don't use them, that those cities that you could have inherited, that millennial inheritance you could have had, I'm going to take it and I'm going to give it to somebody else. You mean pounds, right? What did I say? Talents. Yeah. Pounds. pounds. <laughs> i got to correct myself again. I was really trying to be infallible there. I guess it doesn't oh, no. work. <laughs> Can't be a pope after all. I was going to run, you know, after Ratzinger steps down. Huh? <laughs> Bible-believing Pope, yeah. Boy. Oh, boy. But, uh, now, something interesting here. Now, you're not going to be able to see this if you're listening on sermon audio. What I have here is a ruler, okay? Just to put things into perspective. Uh, Pro Psalm chapter 90, verse 10 says, The days of our years are three score years and ten. And if by reason of strength they be fourscore years, yet is their strength labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. Mm -hmm. Okay, now what's three score years and ten? Seventy. Seven. Yep, a score in the Bible is twenty, so three score or sixty plus ten is seventy. So the Bible says that your average life is seventy to eighty years. And that's about right. Some people live longer than that, some people don't. Okay? Now, on this ruler here, we'll assume that one inch is 100 years. All right? Now, what I did here, I split the difference between 70 and 80. At three quarters of an inch, 
I marked it, <coughs> marked it with tape. So that'd be like 75 years. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, this is about the average life that you're going to live right there. Okay. And then from the one inch mark to where my fingers are, that's the millennial uh, kingdom. Think about that. What do you have to suffer here? The little bit that you have to suffer in that little tiny three quarters of an inch is going to be all that that you'll inherit. That's something else. And then over here past this finger is eternity. Wow. Don't have to suffer too much, do we? Oh, but I'm really having a hard time as a Christian here. Yeah, well, keep up with it. You know, if you're doing right, if you're doing right, <laughs> you know, let me just repeat that. If you're doing wrong and suffering for it, well, you need to change that. But if you're working for the Lord and serving the Lord and you're suffering, keep at it. You know, it'll come back. Uh, now, I just want to make a couple of points here in closing. How are you spending your time? Something to think about there. You know, what did the Bible say there earlier? We read about that the kingdom of God is likened unto a child. Isn't it nice when your children want to spend time with you? Sometimes, you know, I'm an uncle. I don't have children, but, you know, I have my nephews and nieces. But sometimes I've gone to see them, you know, and you walk in and you're like, hey, how you doing? You know, and they're like watching a video or something. And you're like, hey, oh, oh, oh hi, Uncle Brian. And you're right back to it. You know, sometimes we're like that with the Lord. <laughs> you know, sometimes the Lord's like, hey, how's your day go? Huh? <laughs> huh? What? <laughs> Be careful about that. I will, I will confess a fault openly and freely, and that is, I do not pray enough. There are many times I get to the end of the day and I'm like, okay, I prayed for a meal. You know, I think that's all I prayed today. It's not too good. I haven't talked to my father in a while. Something to fix up there. Okay? Now, if you're listening to this message, are you saved? I know everybody here is. You know, I've heard your testimonies and things, but I realize that there are people that are not sure about salvation that listen to these messages. Man, you better get saved. Okay? Better come to the place where you know you're a sinner and you need to get saved. All right? That's so important. Another question. How real is eternity to you? It's rough sometimes. We're, I mean, the Lord tells us to occupy. That's there. You know, you're to provide for your own. You're to have normal things in life. I understand that. But you have to keep that 10 inches in mind. Keep that big, long area there called the Millennial Kingdom. You see, we're not done here with this earth when we go to be with the Lord. A lot of people believe that. You believe, you know, well, I, when I die, I'll never come back here to the earth again. That'll be it. That's not true. We're coming back. And you're going to have an inheritance depending on what you did with this little tiny three quarters of an inch of a life. Something to think about there. Uh, and it's interesting too. I just want to say something. For those out there that are saying, you know, oh man, I really haven't done much with my life. The beautiful thing about the Lord is you can start today. Okay? You can start this week. And I don't want to sound Catholic. You know, they, they do this thing of Lent. You know, what are you going to give up for Lent and whatever? Whatever, you know. But you ought to give up something for the Lord. Okay, you can even learn things from pagan people, you know. Okay, and, and of course they, you know, they give it up and sometimes they aren't really giving it up, whatever. I'm talking about real, true sacrificing for the Lord. Something to give up for the Lord. Make sure you do something like that before you go home in the three quarters of an inch that you have. All right? And that doesn't have to be money. It can be time. It can be energy. Whatever. Do something for the Lord this week. Make a fool out of yourself for the Lord this week. <laughs> you know? I mean, as I've said before many times, work for the Lord, serve the Lord, speak for the Lord, stand up for His Word, and you'll suffer. <laughs> You don't have to go out of your way to make yourself suffer. You don't have to, you know, do the Catholic thing of whipping yourself or, you know, starving yourself or anything like that. Fasting's good, but you know, you don't have to force yourself to suffer. You just live for the Lord, it'll come. You know. <laughs> just as simple as that. But get something done. Because that's God's plan for you. 
His plan is for you to bring him pleasure. That's why he gave you life. That's why he created you. You know, so that's going to be it for this morning. So thank you so much for listening. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. If these sermons or videos have been a blessing to you, please help us to continue this work by supporting this ministry. You can send a check payable to Brian Denlinger to King James Video Ministries, P.O. Box 300, Bradford, PA, 16701. Or you can donate online through PayPal at our website, www.kingjamesvideoministries.com. Thank you, and may the Lord Jesus Christ bless you.